we're long overdue for a long form podcast just for the sake of maintaining the health of our relationship. We are. You just called me my darling. I think that <laughs> Have was I ever said that before? Never, like in 20 years. Hi, babe. So it's my normal greeting. How's, how is that? How, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let's unpack that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to unpack that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, lots to talk about today. It's been a while since you've been on the show. And uh, I think a good place to kick it off, though, is bring us up to speed on what's going on with Shri Mu, Do Life, Not oh, Cheese. Because there's been that. a lot of activity <laughs> around your burgeoning <laughs> vegan cheese empire. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for asking. For, first of all, I just want to thank everybody who has been an early subscriber. You guys blow me away. You've been amazing and you've been so supportive. And even as I've had to send a couple updates with sort of a shift in schedule, um, just the overwhelming amount of love and support from podcast listeners. So thank you, beautiful tribe. I totally love you guys. Um, it's really super exciting. Things have been going amazingly well. Um, I have an amazing facility in Southeast LA and it's a gorgeous kitchen facility, uh, sort of, it's within another um, uh, like kitchen village or kitchen facility of many, many, right. many. It's like a compound yeah, like of a compound. commercial kitchens, but you have your own designated I, space. Yeah, right? I have my own space and it has windows to the outside and it's really super beautiful. So yeah, so the update is, is that uh, we had a little bit of um, a challenge with the health department. Well, let's let's back it up even further because okay. the last time that you were on the show was the first announcement. I just kind of, of you just yeah, I didn't I didn't know that you were gonna oh you're gonna announce your cheese company now like it's is it real yet like you know and you're like yeah we're doing it and I was like oh okay so the announcement was made and I think at the time you had a goal of of trying to just get like 200 subscribers. And this would be um, a manageable group of people to kind of, um, you know, learn the process of what it's gonna entail to put together this subscription box on the monthly or on the quarterly. Um, and in the, in, the, in the wake of that, you ended up getting, even though like, it's not like, it's not like there's been any kind of marketing or, or advertising around this. I think you have like well over 300, right? Oh, no, now, I have like over that. 400. Oh, 400 now, mm -hmm. 400 subscribers. So for those who are new to the show or don't know what we're talking about, Julie is a vegan cheese master. It's something that she has perfected over many years uh, prior to writing her book about it called This Cheese is Nuts and an evolution that has continued in the wake of that book and its success. And that book basically tells everybody, here's how you make these amazing plant-based cheeses. But more and more people are saying, that's great, but I'm never gonna do that. Like, just can, can I just buy it? Will you just make it for me and I can buy it? And every dinner party we went to or everywhere we went, you would always bring your, your wares with you and it would always awe people. And this kind of birthed this idea of trying to create a company out of this, which you have now um, taken uh, from the gestation vision uh, uh, bucket and placed it into the manifestation reality bucket. And since we last sat down on this podcast, you've gone from ideation into execution. You've raised some money, you've rented this commercial kitchen, you've hired a bunch of people, you have all these subscribers now, and you're now in the final stages of finalizing the packaging and you're gonna be shipping very soon. And in the midst of all of that, there's everything that goes into a startup, the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the, the kind of pap the paperwork that goes with all the regulatory stuff, health department and all of that. And obviously there's always kind of like delays and this stuff takes longer, but you have a very patient um, group of subscribers mm -hmm. that you've been in constant communication with and you're really on the eve of shipping your first batch coming soon, right? That is all true. Yeah. Beautifully. So is that a good synopsis? Beautifully pre I mean, presented. I just wanted to bring people up to speed yeah, no, if they're just, good. if they just, you know, sort of yeah. happen upon this podcast yeah. and don't know what we're talking yes. about. Yes. So um, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing process. It's been rather fluid. I've been in my flow. Things are just coming together and really 
really with a lot of ease and a lot of grace. And that is evidence to me of the alignment of this expression. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's sort of the culmination of all of my life experience. And what I've realized is that I'm at the beginning of my innovation. So the cheeses that I'm shipping in the first sacred box of Shrink Me Do Life, it comes six flavors in a box. Those are the new evolution of cheeses. So they aren't actually the recipes that are in the book that I published because mm -hmm. it's always a forward ev evolving, you know, process of creation. But I'm also extremely blessed from all the cookbooks that I published. I've created almost 500 recipes and then also doing all of our retreats and having my spiritual community online, Water Tiger. Everybody that is with me has worked with me spiritually and had an experience. And this includes investors as well as actual, I call them sacred makers. So right. in Srimu, we are creating an environment. So it's not just that there are cultures in the cheese. We are creating a culture of awareness, no pun intended. Right. So the the um, when we make the cheese, um, you know, I was I was feeling into you know okay you know you would normally call all oh, my staff my kitchen staff or my kitchen help, and I was meditating into that and I was like I'm going to call them sacred makers and I'm not even going to ask them to do something to achieve that title because I want to name them I want to give them that mantle from the very beginning so that they know how special they are and they know that who touches your food is a key ingredient to the way that it tastes. So the sacred makers in our organization, in our community, uh, they are required to do a breathing meditation before anybody touches the cheese. So we are all plant-based, everybody that is in our facility, and we are also all meditators. Um, and I have a couple. It's a job requirement. It is actually, yes. yeah. It's a it's a cultural preference. It's you know we set an intention to create a certain environment, and my two managers actually uh, have the title of flow masters, uh -huh. and um, I just want to give them a shout out, Chloe Stein and Becca Rife. They have been by my side, and they they've been brilliant, yeah, just both absolutely women. brilliant, brilliant. What's your title? Uh, my title is actually Mother Ark. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to do business cards and put that on there? I don't know. Mother Ark? Yeah. ARC or ARC? A -R -K? It's ARC, but it kind of has a double meaning, you know? Uh -huh. And uh, that- Because you're the whole, you're the vessel. It's a, you know, Shreem is a frequency. So, so when I talk about it, um, there's the business mission. So the business mission is to create the most delicious artisanal cheeses on planet Earth. Not vegan cheeses, just cheeses. So Shrimu is the new evolution of cheese. It's better than cheese. It's not cheese. It's a devotional mm -hmm. offering. Uh, but that goes along with that is the sacred mission or the secret mission is to give everybody a frequency and an opportunity of awakening into the beauty of who they are. And so within everything we do, it has energy signatures or mm -hmm. frequency. And so Shrimu is a carrier of this intention, this devotion, this prayer that I have for humanity to awaken into who they really are. Right, and in your facility, you found these super dope like outfits or uniform, because you gotta wear like a certain kind of clothing if you're gonna be doing food, right? So you found these like Japanese jumps, black jumpsuits that look like they're out. Like this is, if you watch a James Bond movie, like all the, you know, and there's they're in some un, some underground lair where the bad guy is, they're all wearing like some kind of really cool, like I, it kind of looks like that. Well, it it's, reminds me of that. you know, I mean, the brand is about aesthetic and, you know, this is moments of our lives. One of the reasons that I made sure that I was able to get a facility with actually windows to the outside is that you spend a lot of hours making cheese and you want the environment to be in alignment with the brand. So um, I'm a fashion designer and I care about design and aesthetic and I don't want people to feel like they're wearing something that's, that's not pleasing to them or not comfortable or not functional, but also just not beautiful. So we found these amazing jumpsuits and we are mission-based. So everybody there is very clear about the mission. And so they're sort of like flight suits. Right, they look like flight yeah, yeah, like and, jumpsuits. And then we were able to get, like we're wearing like black sort of, stocking caps rather than, you know, ugly hair nets and, you know, there's requirements. You have to have beard nets and things like that. So you need like a cool patch. We do. The, we oh, we do. do. They one? say sacred maker and oh, they say I've, mother I, art. I haven't seen that. And they say flow That's master. Yeah. And they're black that. and gold. They're right. in alignment with And them. you're like piping in like 
bird songs and stuff like that. Yeah. So the sound <laughs> environment that we've yeah. created in the facility is all nature sounds. So mm-hmm. you know, Shrimu is a is a is a movement um, in service to planet Earth and to remind us how sacred our planet is and how much love and care we need to offer her. So. Uh, we play just a loop of nature sounds from all over the planet. It could be the Amazon, it could be thunder, it could be ocean waves, it could be dol- dolphins, it could be whales, but that's playing constantly. We also infuse an essence of orange blossom into the air. So we have diffusers right. going. Um, because, you know, uh, when I was touring in facilities to rent, I was shocked at the Um, environments where our food is prepared. And it really gave me pause because there's a lot of facilities that are not very clean and they smell horrible. And you're like, and you think like, oh my goodness, like I get something in a package and I think it was prepared in a clean facility and there are rules, but um, you know, you can go beyond that. So Mm -hmm. Uh, My intention is to create an environment that is very supportive to the team and that the hours they spend in the Srimu culture is going to be um, like wings for what they do in the rest of their lives. So we have many artists, we have fine artists, we have musicians, and Srimu is about giving them that support, sort of that spiritual foundation. And Everyone is very excited and very committed, and they're really happy to be a part of something that is focused on meaningful change. And so the spirit in the facility has been very high, have people just showing up early, they can't wait to get in. So it's been really cool. And the other thing that's coming that I haven't executed yet is I contacted a nature photographer named Andrew Studer, or Stutter. And um, he does beautiful, beautiful nature photographs. And so I'm licensing three of his images, two of the Columbia Gorge, and they're beautiful, um, you know, a river in the forest with the green so that we can really viscerally remember this planet that we're serving. You license them for what? Like to, to make put on the walls, like a big mural. Yeah, big, yeah, big right. mural. Like yeah. wallpaper. Or yeah, something exactly. Like that. Yeah. Um, and you can't. There's all these weird things about like what you can and can't say or call it. Like, mm. you, so you're just steering clear of the word cheese pretty much altogether. Like, instead of saying this is a camembert and this is a blue and this is a mozzarella, you came up with these names like birdie and. Yeah. So there's six flavors. So there's a, a truffle, a cashew truffle infused elegance. This is an age wheel and it's called Bertie, B E R T I E. Um, there's another flavor that's called Spire, which is blue inspired, but it's made blue with spirulina. There's another flavor that's called Elder, which has a food grade activated charcoal in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also do a smoked almond cheddar ball, which is not your grandma's, I can't, not cheese ball. It's a right. not cheese, but it's called Bonfire. And then I also have a jar of, it's called Cloud Nine. So it's uh, cashew balls floating in salted crystal waters. Wow. And it's it's this fresh thing. So I am calling it not cheese on the label. Uh, it has to be called nut spread on the back. But because I'm doing wholesale, I'm not, sorry, I'm doing retail. I'm not doing wholesale. I have a little bit more leeway. So I've been able to really make this a creative offering to the, subscri- to the subscribers who are my beloved tribe and and my priority. Right. So when you subscribe, you get you can you sign up and you can get a delivery either quarterly or monthly, right? You can get it monthly, monthly. every other month or quarterly. So uh-huh. you have three options. And you get six cheeses in this beautiful box. Six cheeses in the box. Yeah. I had to do some re- my challenges were this, first of all, the packaging and the weight of the box. So this had to be reimagined a couple times, which is what what the time lag was. I mean, really, I'm really good. I said the last two weeks of November and we start shipping December 9th. So Mm -hmm. I feel pretty proud about that. That's a real high execution. And especially at the level and the way the cheeses are coming out, they're just beautiful. Um, So in a box, you have a jar of the uh, cloud nine, which is the clouds floating in water. You have the smoked almond cheddar, which is bonfire. And you have four wheels this month. Mm -hmm. So there's two Bertie, and then one spire and one elder. Right. Well, the cool thing, <clears throat> there's a bunch of cool things, but one of the cool things is that um, I've seen you, like this This has come together, like once you committed to this, it really has been as if the universe conspired to support it. Like 
it's happened very quickly and all the things that you kind of needed to have happen that are huge hurdles for anybody who's trying to you know foster a startup have all kind of come together very fluidly and easily which is i th- i you know i see that as an indication that this is the right thing for you and with that i've seen a shift in you like your disposition your personality um to be you know very kind of empowered like you're standing in your power like this is right you have a direction you have a um like a north star and everything is kind of like congealing around that to support you and it's been cool and i think it's been great for our relationship too like you have this thing that's really exciting for you that is connecting with people and uh it's been fun to kind of just observe that Mm -hmm. yeah it's true i mean it you know i think that all of my experience having been a fashion designer and and been, you know, had my own company and gone through production and all of that. And then all of the spiritual work that I've done, all of the recipes that I've created, the books, the retreats, like everything sort of led me up to this moment. And so it's almost like everything was already prepared. And that's why it was effortless because all of that all of that preparation, you know, it wasn't mm-hmm. overnight. It's been, you no, know, years been, yeah, in the I making. Mean, it's not like you had an idea recently. Yeah. Like this has been an idea mm-hmm. in your mind, but the execution part of it is is fairly recent. But I will say too that I have, um, uh, I feel that I've gone through a big expansion since July. And uh, I'm definitely in another level of life embodiment, which is, you know, what I call it for me. And it's this... Alignment that is so precise, that is so undeniably me and so undeniably in alignment with who I am, that allows me to care for this this mission as a very um, worthy steward. You know, in the past, I may have been sort of um, spontaneous or made decisions very quickly, uh, and it's been very quick but I've been very, very protective of her and very unwavering. It's very clear to me what the mission is and what the journey is. And I'm very connected to my intuition and I know uh, I know the beauty, the power, and the importance of this opportunity. And it's a different me. It's a different, I've been able to stand in this alignment in ways even in finance or negotiating you know, uh, equity, things like that which it's, it's, it's not a hardness. It's a no, it's just a knowing, it's a knowing of what is right. And I feel I have a responsibility to this product, this mission, Shrimu is an energy and it's like, I serve her. Mm. And so it's, it's beyond Julie, the personality and it's really mission focused. Right. Um, one of the most fun things is when you do these tastings, like whether, you know, we're going over, over to a friend's house, you know, people that, that aren't, you know, on the plant-based tip and you have an opportunity to share what you're doing with them and to kind of, or, or like, you know, you've done a couple events like Mercado Sagrado the other weekend where you have people kind of sniffing around it, but skeptical, like, what is this? And I don't know, or they haven't, they've had an experience with plant-based cheese in the past. And, you know, that, that comes with a certain, you know, baggage or expectation. And, uh, and then to gauge, like, watch, to observe them taste it, and then their facial <laughs> changes that happen. I mean, it's, it's such a unanimous thing, right? I mean, basically every single person that has tasted this or tested it has walked away, like, blown away. So it was really fun for me at Mercado Sagrado. And actually, I wish that I'd had a camera because the amount of the facial expressions in support and in the thumbs up of Shrimu and the way it w- tasted was shocking, actually. It w- was even even surprising me, even though I've seen it time and time and time again. And yesterday, for instance, I was at an event at a, a yoga studio called Be Crystal Clear, and it was a women's entrepreneur bazaar, like gathering holiday. And I had, during the afternoon of two hours, I had women that were Italian, Spanish, Swiss, Swedish, German, all give me the bravo for my cheese. And that is the... Um, the confidence and the, the the vote that you know is really really means something right. because these are cheese cultures. I right. mean, no pun intended again, but um, yeah, it's been really really amazing. Um, I've had a few people refuse samples who have made the statement that they don't eat plant based food, 
Uh, but other than them, uh, I haven't had anybody be disappointed in the taste they don't they eat received. plant-based food and yeah. other they only eat animal products that's what, yeah that, I mean I don't what does yeah. that mean I don't know I, I think I, didn't I think what that is 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 um I think what they're really saying it I mean look you know there's only a very small number of people that don't eat plant-based foods and we all eat we all eat some, some plants hopefully. in our diet yeah. I think what they're saying is mm-hmm. <clears throat> they're that's based on an assumption that this is a highly processed product. Because if you go to the store and you look at what's available in terms of plant-based foods or meat analogs or you know, dairy analogs, they're all you know, packed with lots of preservatives and artificial flavoring and colors and things like that. So I would suspect that that's a reaction. Like they're, they're thinking, oh, this is something, there's no way it could taste that good unless you put all kinds of crazy chemicals in it and things like right. that. Right, I mean, they didn't taste it. If they had tasted it, they would have known there were no right. chemicals but, but, in but it. Yeah. There, you, you, yeah. I think you need to put, you need to make front and center mm-hmm. that this is a natural, pro- there, is no, there is none of that stuff in yeah. it. I mean, it's, it's actually shocking how few ingredients exactly. are in this thing. Exactly, it's definitely a, a mastery of simplicity and of pureness. Um, so you can read the ingredients, you know, online and it's, it's, it's really, it's very simple and very pure and very beautiful. So, well, I'm super excited for you. It's been really fun to see this thing take flight. Um, for those that are interested in learning more, uh, shrimu.com. That's correct. S-R-I-M-U.com. You can go there and learn all about it and all that kind of stuff. And I'll put a link up in the show notes to that, but I want to switch gears here for a minute. Um, it is... November 24th today when we're recording this. This is gonna go up, it's gonna publish on December 11th, um, right in the lead up, the thick of holiday season that we're now embarking upon. And we kind of have an annual tradition of of doing a podcast together to help people kind of navigate um, the vicissitudes and the landmines that befall us this time of year. Um, But before we kind of dive into that, I posted on Instagram the other day and and Twitter maybe a week earlier that I'm taking my first break in seven years, which I'm very excited about. I'm going to places unknown (laughs) on December 3rd, but I'm really pulling the plug on work um, at Thanksgiving and I'm gonna be kind of disappearing until uh, first week of January. Well, I know. The second well, I week know of where you are. <laughs> you will know where I am. I don't. I don't need to advertise where I'm going. I mean, I'm not going to listen. You know, just because I'm doing this doesn't mean I'm not going to throw up an Instagram post here and there, or do a story, or tweet, or whatever. But I am going to be um, making a hard and fast rule around work. And the truth is that, and I said this in the post, but for those that that didn't maybe didn't see that. I've been running and gunning for literally seven years straight from the beginning of this podcast. And it's a seven day a week job. Like I've posted every Sunday night since we began this. We tried to shift the schedule a little bit and change that date and it didn't really work so well. So we went back to Sunday night, which means I basically work you know, every Sunday, you know, like I'm, I'm working pretty much most of the day on Sunday. And I think there's an, a sense that like, oh, you just do these podcasts and they go up. But maybe that's how some people do it, but that's not our process. Um, I have an amazing team of people that I work with, but it's very, you know, I'm very hands-on and it's, it's quite all-consuming to do six episodes a month on top of all the other things that I'm doing professionally and then just you know trying to make sure that I stay married to you and be a, a present parent to our kids. That's the most and, important thing. And having two households during the week where you know either you're downtown or I'm downtown with our elder daughter, which is something we've talked about in the past. Like it's been complicated, it's been challenging. And and over this seven year period, I'm very proud of what we have co-created. Um, but it's been a ton of work, you know, and I really haven't taken a break. I get to travel to all these cool places and meet all these cool people, but it is invariably tied to some kind of work commitment. And certainly I take a day here and there or whatever, or I'll duck out and go to a matinee. I take little breaks, but I never have taken a real vacation where I'm like, okay, I'm totally tapping out or anything extended. So this is, long overdue, I'm very excited about it, and I desperately need to recharge. I wouldn't say that I'm burned out. Um, I'm definitely not burned out, but I've sensed over the last couple months um, that 
I'm just tired, you know? And, and I go into these interviews just slightly less enthusiastic than I should be or that I would prefer to be. And I wanna be in love with the process and I wanna be excited and exuberant and enthusiastic when I sit down across the table from a guest. I think I owe them that. I think I owe the audience that. And in order to play the long game and take out an insurance policy that will allow me to continue to do this, like you have to take breaks. And that gestation period is important for so many reasons, not just to rest my physical body, but to really allow myself to ruminate, to have this space so that I can um, begin to put the pieces together on what the next thing is or, or what it is that I really wanna manifest and, and create in this world. And when I'm just in the, the daily gestalt of trying to do the show and get the show up, my vision extends only to what I have to get done that day and not to the bigger picture of like, why am I even doing this? Or what it what is it that I'm actually trying to accomplish here? What is the mission statement? And in order to really get clarity and refine that clarity, you know, I'm gonna take this break. And it's a little scary because, you know, I, I said this in the Instagram post, like if I lived alone, I would work more. Like I love it. Like it's not like, oh, I dread it. Like I love it. I would work all the time, you know, and that's another indication why I need to pull the ripcord and get a little perspective on this. Definitely. Well, it's well-deserved and, you know, everybody needs time to recharge. So, you know, it's going to be fun to see mm. what you discover, what you uncover, and, um, you know, you, you have a lot to say. You have a lot of other things to share besides the podcast. You know, you're a brilliant writer. And, you know, there are many, many other expressions that are there for you uh, if you want to bring them through. But as you said, if you're only focused on the podcast and you never take breaks, you don't have the space for those right. inspirations to come in. It's like, yeah, I'd like to and write another normal. book, but like there's mm -hmm. no time, you know, there's no yeah. time yeah. right now. And I've got to reconfigure some things to provide a little extra space so I can do things, you know, that are important that are outside of, you know, just what I do when I sit down at this table. And thank you for all the beautiful, beautiful work that you've put out and that you've created. And it's affected many, many, many people. And I know that many people listening to this are agreeing with what I'm saying right now. Um, really, really, this offering has been profoundly impactful on many people's lives. Wow, so thank you for that. that. But we would like you to still be around yeah, and be I, I able want to, to stick offer. Around. And the thing is, like, can I do it? Like, am um, I going to be able to resist, like, checking my email? Am I going to, like, that's the test. Like, that's like, ooh, that makes me uncomfortable. Another reason why I need to do this. Yeah, definitely. Know? And maybe then after this reset, and, you know, you really worked the entire year to be able to take this month off. Yeah, You've been planning like, this for one year. The last six weeks in particular have been insane, you know? Mm -hmm trying to get ready to, because the show, for people that are listening, the show is going to continue to go on. We've banked a ton of episodes and we worked really hard to get them all locked and loaded. So the show will continue without yeah, so don't respite, worry. without a break when I'm gone um, because of all the work that we did to front load it in the meantime. That's but I'm beautiful. excited. I'm a little nervous about the whole thing. And, and let me just say that, you know, just to check my privilege a little bit, like it's a gift that I get to be able to give myself this opportunity. And I, I'm very aware and realize that, you know, not everybody can do that. So sure. I'm grateful to have the opportunity. And it was something that that um, I thought I was gonna do last year, but I didn't take the steps required in order to do it. And the time just passed and I just filled it up with a bunch of stuff. So it was like, know? oh, you wanna take yeah. a vacation? Okay, you can do that next yeah. year. I know, in so December. then it was like, literally the plan for this mm. break began like in January of, you know, a full mm -hmm. year ago to get ready for yeah. it. So yeah. anyway. Well, I I'm hope you have an amazing, it. amazing experience. And thank I hope you. to find you yeah, sometime you. mid month. So here we are, we're, um, we're on this train headed into the holiday season. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I would, I think it's fair to say ourselves included, like experience a little bit of anxiety, extra anxiety and, and stress, and perhaps even some distress around this period of time because we find ourselves in family situations that perhaps trigger us in certain ways or bring up old patterns and 
And despite our best efforts or plans to not be reactive, we find ourselves reacting in an unhealthy way, repeating that cycle of unhealthy behavior. We feel compelled to overextend ourselves by showing up for too many people because we feel that's what's expected of us. And we feel ourselves um, over-consuming or over-participating in the consumerist cycle that is baked into this time of year. It's a trope to say that every year the holiday season starts earlier, um, but it does. Like it used to be an unwritten rule that no Christmas music would be heard in any retail store until Thanksgiving or the day after Thanksgiving. But I was in Starbucks like 10 days ago, like early November, and there were they were playing Christmas music. I think they started there. before Halloween. It's insane. Yeah. It is absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. And it's all driven to get us to get our wallets and our pocketbooks out and spend money that either we don't have or we don't wanna have because we feel that's part of the social contract that we Mm -hmm. signed up for. So help us find a healthier way to pass through this triggering time of year. Well, as I always say, triggering. Uh, As I always say, this time of year is the entire society has, um, you know, in, in in my awareness, deliberately, uh, put a an opposing force on top of the natural cycle of life. So in December, we see as the sun starts get, getting lower sooner, and we start, you know, Rich and I at like 6.30, we're like, good night. Yeah, I'm like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> going like, to I've bed been going now. to bed at like, when it, when it gets dark early, I'm literally in bed at eight o'clock. Yeah, right. And then if I have to do something that keeps me up at night and I'm in bed at like 10, I feel lousy the next day. And I was like, I, it's not like I stayed up till two in the morning. No, but the thing is, is it's that, you know, the the world is dark and the inclination is then to retire, to go within. It's an inner experience. So when you're coming into December, the natural cadence of life in the Northern Hemisphere is that the days are getting shorter and it's a time of inner reflection. It's when all of creation comes to a death and then starts to be reborn after the solstice. But instead, we have this super imposition of this consumerism program, which is telling you that you should be spending more money than you have. If you just tap into the feeling inside of yourself, you're spending money, but inside of yourself, it feels like you shouldn't be spending money. It's in, it's in fact exactly counter. It's like, but you have this program that tells you that if you don't buy presents for all your loved ones, then you're not showing that you mm. love them. And you get caught up in it and it's kind of cool. And, you know, we all like elves and I like Santa Claus and, you know, I like the beautiful tree with the sparkling lights on it and they become family traditions. And so, you know, I think they say that like most of America spends the entire year paying off their credit card debt for what they spend for Christmas. And if we look at really the violence of that and the suppression of that on a human being, just even energetically, like if it's just sitting there, if that debt is sitting there, it is actually pulling from the human, pulling from the soul. So uh, first of all, just to recognize that this counterforce is there and that you can sort of refine it or maybe recreate it in a more simplistic way. I'm not saying, you know, don't buy any gifts. You could buy a gift for people. You could just try to simplify, envision more creative ways, uh, make up ways that you can share the gift of experience instead of stuff. So Mm -hmm. maybe an amazing dinner or an amazing treasure hunt or an amazing, you know, offering of a play or a song. Try to be more creative than the mall or than Amazon or, you know, wherever we normally go to satisfy these needs. The other thing is just being aware of the landfill and what are you buying and what is then going, you know, where is the waste going? There's so much waste. It's so much waste. It is so strange that, that this holiday falls upon us at this time of year, because it is true, like every instinct in my body is to hibernate, to pull the sheets up, to go within, to, to kind of, um, be a little bit more reclusive than I wouldn't than I would ordinarily, and to kind of store the chestnuts to get through the winter. And yet, we're compelled or sort of pressured into this environment in which we have to do the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. It runs counter to our 
natural rhythms and the cycle of this time of year, unless you're living in, in you know, south of the equator. Well, that's one of the reasons yeah. why, you know, well, I can't reveal, but we're going to someplace with sun, Yeah. you know, and that was the reason. And I'm, I'm really interested, I'm intrigued to know that if you're, I wonder if we're in the, if we're in the Southern hemisphere, if you feel the same energetic, that's I'm what I, interested. That's what I want to find I out. I want to find out. Yeah, I want to find yeah. out. Because if it doesn't, longer, the sun is shining. If it doesn't, you and I are, for the rest of our lives, we'll be in the <laughs> Southern Hemisphere during that time because it's always a bummer. And you're, it's always. Some people love it, though. Yeah. I don't know. Just for me, like, mm -hmm. you know, it affects me deeply. Affects and every December, I'm like, what? we should go somewhere where it's not like this right now. And mm -hmm. now we can, you know. But I would say also, like, on the point of, trying to be a little bit more creative with the gift giving um, ethos, some of the most meaningful and fun times that we had around this time of year with the kids were when we were literally flat broke and penniless. And we, had to, we, we were forced to be creative about what we were gonna do to get through this experience. And there were a couple of years where the rule was, we're not buying anything, you have to make something. Right, and mm -hmm. so we were compelled to get creative. Trapper made a video, like a, a hilarious video that I still, I watched it recently, it was so funny, and that was a long time ago. Um, we bought like super, well we did buy, we bought super t cheap t-shirts and then we painted them or we painted a pair of like um, cheap sneakers or whatever, just to create like little art pieces mm -hmm. instead yeah. of like doing the normal thing. Some of the most, the most fun times. So for anybody who's going through a dismantling or doesn't have flow right now, or is really, you know, in, in a sacred moment that is challenging you financially, uh, please get creative and uh, turn it into something positive. You will never forget these times. These times are special actually. And it's not really um, it's not really expansive or the life experiences that you remember the Christmases or the holidays or whatever you celebrate where you got more stuff. You remember the more meaningful things, the dinner, the mm. play, the song, uh, the comedy skit, whatever you're able to create. Yeah, I mean, it also amplifies that that um, thing where you're measuring your experience against the experience of others. And I it's think that's very shame provoking for a lot of people. Like they can't, oh, I can't do it like that. Or this guy's doing, look what he's doing for, you know, it's just the whole thing is like super unhealthy. Yeah, it is, definitely is. What about going into the, fa the, 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 family. the extended family situation? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, is obviously the, the holidays are loaded. We all know that the families hold the biggest triggers uh, for, all of us. They you know, installed the trigger. They installed. Well, they, actually, they installed the buttons. I would say you so. installed the trigger at a soul level, and then Maybe. you chose this family, <laughs> and they're providing the perfect soil. I know what for I want to do in this life. I want to be. Triggered. I want to have a button that makes me go crazy <laughs> when somebody says this. But hopefully, you know? that provides you the evolution so that you can clear whatever that whatever that uh, miasm or that imbalance is. But the the big um, truth that. I think is our friend and is an opportunity for us to move beyond uh, all this um, assessment and judgment and analysis of humans and our culture and conditions and all kinds of things is to understand that there is no consensus. There's great power in understanding there is no consensus. There is only one of you in the entire multiverse. There is only one of every one of us in the entire multiverse. But if it's a multiverse, isn't aren't I having a parallel experience somewhere else? Just well, yeah, but what does that have to do with this? <laughs> well, so then there's could, more than one of could, me. Well, yeah, right. Well, we, but that doesn't. There's have, another me having a totally different experience in a in in the in the broader multiverse. Definitely. And so, okay. do you find solace in that <laughs> no, or expansion in that? I just I mean, trying I to would. understand your point. Go ahead. No, my point is, is that it, it, for some reason humans are always trying to um, have these long discussions and and do analyses and decide inside their mental construct that. A certain way is the way, or, you know, and this can be in opinions, ways of life, however you live, there is no consensus. And when you understand there is no consensus, you can possibly stop trying to feel triggered or wounded by your family having another reality or another truth. 
if you understand that each person will have their own perspective and they have the right to have that perspective, you can just simply let go. And just rather than go into family um, dinners or holiday gatherings where you're, you know, with people from different political parties or people for different dietary lifestyles, there's no reason to create drama or emotional outburst for reasons of differences of opinions or choices in the way of being. If you're centered in yourself, uh, you have that peace and that awareness. So walk me through the brass tacks of that of this. Let's say you're you're getting the family, you're getting on a plane, you're headed to this, you're gonna you're landing in Cincinnati, and you're gonna go to this <laughs> Not from dinner. Cincinnati, but okay. Well, I know I'm taking. I'm just creating right. a you know a, 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 an example. Um, Uncle Jerry's gonna be there. You know, mm -hmm. he's probably gonna drink too much like he always does, and then he's gonna say that thing. And last time he did, this is what happened, and. And you kind of know that that program is just waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And despite your best intentions of having it go differently this time, you know, you let it go. You did it. I'm letting it go. I'm okay, fine. And then it just it keeps going until finally you're like, all right, I've had enough. And then you say the thing, and then the whole thing goes to shit, mm -hmm. right? Like I mm -hmm. think a lot of people can relate to some version of that. So in a very practical way, like how do you, like what is it that you have to do to avoid that pitfall or stop yourself from doing the thing that's contributing to the, the, the you know, the greater problem? Well, I mean, ultimately there. it's doing the inner work and all of that outburst comes from you or us not giving ourselves the attention, the care, the recognition that we need. And so my spiritual mentorship program, which is called Water Tiger, the reason that it's called Water Tiger is it is all designed to bring us into resonance with who we are so that we can fall again in love with who we are. So when you, when you haven't taken care of yourself, your inner child or your needs or your wants, you are looking for validation from the outside. And many of us have this wounding. It's very, very common. And it, to have that, to need your parent to give you that that validation. And it goes on into our 50s and 60s where we're, you know, we're still waiting for our mom or our father to say, you matter, you know, or right. whatever. I see you. Yeah, I see you, you know, <laughs> and and you'll hear the, it's, it's not the setup. Like it, it can be the setup if you happen to have that really amazing relationship with your parent, which you could, or you could not. But the point that we're always waiting for that final validation is just an illusion. We we have our attention in the in you know focused in the wrong place. If we've taken the time to give ourselves the care, to consider ourselves first, to understand that we matter, to understand that every single life forming creation is being shined upon with equal brilliance. There is no discrimination between different life forms. So why, as human beings, do we always think we have to convince other people to think how we think or receive validation from the outside so that we feel enough on the inside. And so I do this mirror practice in Water Tiger where you actually go sit in the mirror and you stare in your eyes and you breathe and you face what is there. And there's a lot of things that come up for people. There's a lot of pain, a lot of tears. Um, they start to see different aspects of themselves. But if they can get through the discomfort of that, they can get to a deeper resonance and alignment with who they are and understand that you have the opportunity and the responsibility to care for yourself as if you were your most beloved child. And what we do is we take all the focus outside of that and we're looking for that validation to be given from the outside. So if you're fully aligned in yourself and you understand that this play is made up of billions of different life forms, you could simply choose to view, what was his name? Uncle, Uncle Harry? Uncle Jerry. Uncle Jerry. You could just View Uncle Jerry. I don't have an Uncle Jerry, yeah, by he the just way. Made I'm, this just, up. I'm making this so up. So yeah. Uncle Jerry could just be like, I'm a tiger and I resonate with that. And Uncle Jerry could just be, you know, an owl. Right. And when you're in that. And what if he's a rhino? So what? Then he's a rhino. It's like there's no reason, you know, a tiger is not going to spend time feeling 
less than or triggered because a rhino is being a rhino. Like a rhino is just being a rhino. It's not, it's not at me. It's not personal at me. I'm unique and I have my own way of moving through life. Sometimes I'll want to dance with people and that'll feel great, but I don't need them to be like me for me to be valid. Right. And that is, a, is it's a huge thing. And I mean, this goes into other topics, you know, in, in our culture and, the, you know, the dialogues that go on on Twitter and that everybody's always pontificating these huge conversations about different points of view. And it's like, you know, my favorite saint, this beautiful woman, uh, Sri Ma Ananda Moi Ma, one of my favorite quotes, she said, every man is right from his own point of view. Mm -hmm. So every woman is right from her own point of view. Yeah. So where is the friction? What are we doing? It's nonsense. It's just nonsense. And when you release that need, Uncle Jerry is not going to do that thing. Well, Jerry going to be Jerry, yeah. right? And, and, and there's nothing you could do about it. And or you the, should do the, about it. Yeah, the, the point is the path to freedom is releasing your need for Jerry to be any different than Jerry already is. Mm -hmm and to focus on the only thing that you can control, which is your reaction or response to Jerry or to the environment that you choose to you know, move yourself into, right? And the more that you can um, kind of be carry that conscious awareness into these tricky environments, and the more grounded and centered that you can become by virtue of mindfulness practices, a meditation practice, sealing your field, which is something that you know you've taught me and that I've done, and we've talked about on this podcast. Um, you you are in a better position to weather those tricky situations by being non-reactive. Like you have a choice. You don't have to react to whatever that person says. You don't have to prove them wrong or to prove that you're right or to uh, need the validation of anybody else. You can just sit in your space, anchor yourself in your seat. And if you have to, you don't have to say anything, but the more non-reactive you can be and the more mindfully responsive you can be, you're in a better position to have a different experience. And the power rests within you to um, change or break that old paradigm and dynamic that continues to repeat itself every year. Don't wait for somebody else to make a different choice or to handle things differently. Don't point your finger across the table at somebody and say, you did it again. That power is, is within you. But, and it, yes, and then let's take it even a level. Let's even be more powerful and let's take it a level beyond that. Let's take it to an observational place and a recognition that every life form is divine. And that means that Uncle Jerry, in his state of awareness at this point in this identity is also divine. It is not for you to judge. And so what if you were able to observe Jerry in his process with unconditional love and acceptance? Mm. Not like I'm gonna make the right move and then I'm gonna be in a better place. Or, but, or look at me, like maybe I'm quietly judging him, but I didn't say anything. How great am I? Yes, so that's not, energy is something. So you're not there if that's where you are. So if you can really just let it go and understand and trust in the play of life, you can just allow events to have unfold, allow people to be who they are and understand with compassion and love that each person is divine and each person is a form of some sort of divinity or aspect of God consciousness, even if they're not awake or they're not choosing to experience something that is in alignment with you. Mm. And um, if, you, if, you, if you truly embody this though, the triggers will simply melt away. And there are chances are that Uncle Jerry will meet you in a completely different way than you ever dreamed possible. Because these energies are things and they're triggering, they're playing off of each other. And another thing to really keep in mind over the holidays and all times is it is a very prudent practice to avoid explosive confrontation always. And the reason is in my awareness, there are actually life forms that eat this explosion. If, if, if you really explode on somebody and you know I've had that experience, you can feel the level of darkness that is in that. You can feel what's going on. So 
we want to not be triggered into those situations because they really do have a dark energy around them. And if you want to be a representative for higher vibration on planet Earth or a higher a vision of eating, of wellness, if you want to be that type of person, that includes staying in neutral, loving compassion and not participating in creating more of this dark energy uh, that is plentiful on planet Earth, which we certainly don't need more of. Mm. I think it's also worth saying that if you don't feel like you are spiritually and emotionally fit to handle that task, you have the power to decline the invita invitation. There's so much pressure on people like, well, every year this is what we do and so I have to go. And the truth is you don't. And just because these people are your family members and you're measuring your experience with your family against some idyllic imagined um, you know, paradigm of what a family, is, a healthy family is supposed to look like and feeling bad because yours doesn't measure up to that. And you feel like you, you're, you're not gonna be able to handle it in an emotionally healthy way, then I think it's also okay to let people know, to give them permission, like, listen, you, know, you're, you, you have to look out for yourself first. And if you don't feel like this is in your best interest to do this, like it's okay if you take a pass. And, and you know, this is something that I've learned in the secret society rooms of, of recovery. Like, you, you know, this time of year is the most- um, Loaded. Loaded of the, you know, like people who are trying to stay sober, you know, relapse, um, you know, people that are active in their disease, it becomes additionally inflamed, you know, disproportionately inflamed around this time of year you know, because of these dynamics and they become so uncomfortable for people that they feel like the only way they can do it is if they numb themselves out and use. So if you are struggling with some form of substance problem, um, it's okay to opt out. Like if you have to, if you feel like that's jeopardizing your ability to stay sober or not take that drink or do that thing, then, you know, your well being is more important than you taking a seat across the table from Uncle Jerry. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that falls under the first step and that is self-care. You, you must be there for yourself first and make sure that you're fulfilled, you're cared for, you're protected, you're nurtured. You have to because no one else is going to do that for you, nor should they. You should be, every decision you make should be, how does this affect my being, my inner child, my little child? Is this in alignment for him? Is this in alignment for her? What is What would be the most nurturing act for her? Mm -hmm. That's where you begin. And when you shift that, that order of priority, then the universe shifts that order. Yeah, I think people feel, um, I mean, it brings up, you know, emotions of guilt. Like I can't, no, I ha you don't understand. Like I have to go. Like if I don't go, like this is gonna happen and this is gonna happen and that's gonna happen. So it's just easier for me to go, even if, you know, like I know I probably, it's not in my best interest. Like the expectation level is just too high and I don't wanna deal with the fallout. Well, it is, it is a real thing. You mm -hmm. know, it is a real thing because when you shift your behavior, that causes the other energies to yeah. jump up and I mean, down. That, so, don't, don't expect to be celebrated for that Well, <laughs> that and so it really has to be a personal choice. Yeah. I mean, you have to be able to stand um, sovereign in your choice. And this is where the mirror work comes in, is when you've really received yourself and really looked at what you're sitting in, what is your spirit sitting in, and you've gone through all the things that you loathe and all the shame and all the um, trauma that's in there from this life, from other lives, when you've actually sat with it and looked at it and resolved it, you start to get more and more power. But I would say overall, even if you choose to go um, and you're not ready to make that stance and you feel it to be too volatile, again, your power is in neutral loving compassion. Just be neutral. Mm. It's fine. You know, and um, you'd be surprised uh, how powerful this practice is. Yeah, you got to channel some Yoda energy. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't you know, matter. The Jedi isn't like mm -hmm. getting into a political argument mm -hmm. um, at a festive holiday gathering. The, no, Je the Jedi is not 
uh, allowing himself to be emotionally agitated by other people. No, they're not. The Jedi out. is constantly in a mindful state of neutrality. Yeah, exactly. And that's the best place from which to, you know, basically uh, exhibit the best version of who you are. Yeah, exactly. And you know, people are on their own timelines. So in our own family, you know, here we are, you know, uh, wellness leaders, advocates, you know, I've created over 500 vegan recipes, um, you know, Shrimu do life. And, you know, just recently, you know, some of my family members, my brother's like, hey, I think I'm going to go vegan. You know, it's been like 10 right. years. So, <laughs> you know, but everybody's on their timeline. Have and you now seen he's, this documentary? Yeah, and now like, he's calling. You know, yeah. But I mean, that's the perfect thing, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, our fa your family, your birth family, usually, at least in our generation, doesn't see doesn't see who's sitting inside their family. And also many of us who came to create a new way, it's a setup. We incarnated into families that we are not like vibration because that's where the transformation happens. So many of us feel like black sheep. Many of us feel lonely, feel misunderstood, isolated. I would say that's probably been historically the biggest pain of in my life to be misunderstood and not seen for who I am. Yeah, I think it's very common. Mm -hmm. I felt that way most of my life. And a big part of the growth curve and the evolution is in the realization that I'm not looking to my family members to resolve that for me. Well, because not, you've- I don't, I'm not, I'm not outsourcing um, that job of getting comfortable with myself to other people. But you've done that because you've developed yourself. Because you've had all right, this because life it's like experience, the, you know the trope of right. the inside and you, job. Because and you that's what it is. You couldn't do that very well before you had done that. So again, it goes back to the self work and the experience. You could call it years experience, but also really the focus of your answer. The answer to your evolution is inside your own being. Yeah. So those anybody else from the outside, it's just irrelevant. It just doesn't matter. And I think. I mean, I'm certainly seeing as I've gotten older how suddenly these competitions within my siblings are just dissolving because suddenly, you know, you're not, nobody's vying for the attention or, you know, one of my father's passed away and my mother's, you know, 92 and it's just things change and they become irrelevant. Yeah, like and then suddenly you're like, it already. yeah, suddenly you're like, hey, what's up? Like, it's just not. It's just not what it was. Like it, it's so loaded when we're younger. We're just looking for that validation. Like see me, see me, see me, see me. And you hear so many stories from people that say, you know, my mother's still hoping that I get a real job. You know, yeah, things like right. I'm. You know, you experience yeah, that yeah. as well. Yeah, of course. Like your like, mom still wants you to be a doctor. I think. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's like I'm 53 <laughs> now. You know what I mean? Like, but the 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 bit the larger point is these patterns become entrenched, like whatever that wounding is or that pain point that you experienced as a young person in a dynamic with another individual, be it your sister, your mom, your dad, your brother, whoever, these things then repeat and get played out like thousands and thousands of times through adulthood. So you're you know, in your 50s and a dynamic that you have with a sibling is exactly the same as when you were like you know, six and 10 or whatever. Uh, and then having that awareness is the first step to resolving it, but then you have to really do the inside work to kind of transcend that and not not just fall prey into kind of doing what you always do. It's hard, it's really hard, but identifying, like understanding what that core wound is first, like how did this begin? Like wh when did we start doing this and why? And then realizing like, it's ridiculous. We're in our 50s now. Why are we still in this dance? But you can't even realize it because you you have to clear the trauma. You have to have faced yourself and find it. because You can't intellectually make it go away. It's not going to. And the thing that that is happening to humanity is these are ancestral patterns that are being handed down from generation to generation. And without spiritual awakening, they are causing a recycling. So you're just going to drop this body, take another life, and you'll come back with the same issues over and over and over again. And so this is the moment of spiritual awakening. This is the moment in history that we're at, and this is the opportunity. And so this is why the devotion to spiritual practice 
to really, really going deep inside your own being and finding out who you are, clearing the trauma, clearing the addictions, claiming your sovereignty, this is the moment we're at. And if you don't resolve them, they will continue through lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And they generally, they don't just continue, they tend to become amplified. Certainly. Right, until you reach a crisis point that forces you or compels you to confront mm -hmm. it. So now's the And those time. are the lucky ones, actually. The people that kind of just repeat it and it's a low grade kind of problem are never you know, in enough pain to actually look at it. Like that's what they, you know, people in the secret say, oh, I'm a grateful alcoholic or I'm a grateful drug addict because the drugs are so, it's so like, this is something I talked about with Russell Brand. He's like, well, clearly, you know, it's the heroin. Like, you know, if you're, it, it's gonna come to an end because it's so obvious what your dilemma is, what your problem is. So the drug addicts are actually the lucky ones because they're forced to confront this thing and it sends them, it kind of catalyzes this trajectory of self-discovery. But short of that, if you're struggling with something that is impeding, you know, negatively, you know, it's negatively in fact impacting your life in some way, but it's it it doesn't percolate up into becoming a full-blown crisis. You could just sort of um, weather it for the rest of your life and never really look at it. Yeah, that's very true. And I mean, it's also stated in, you know, spiritual evolution as well that, you know, the dark, a, someone with a lot of dark energy has a lot more opportunity to self-realize in in some cases than someone who's just sort of like, you know, flatline. Right. Because you're right. Because Skipping then that the could surface. never that could never sort of activate that catalyst moment. Right. So yeah, it's very very true. Yeah. So if you're in a but, dark moment, I always say that if you're really 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 blessed at least once in your life, yeah. you will have a profound sacred moment. Pain is the great lever in all of this, but the truth is, is that the choice is always available to you because everybody knows what their the thing is that they need to look at, you know, on some level, some level of conscious awareness. Um, and the choice is available to you to confront it or deal with it. It's just easier when it when it blows up in your face and then you have no choice, you but have this to. Is, but this is something I've been pondering lately a lot. And, and it's like, what if everything that you did really mattered, like really had a big impact? And, you know, you look at the modern life and what we're in and, and how our life goes and our days. And it's it's very easy to be lazy. It's very easy to just, when you have space, turn on Netflix. It's very easy to medicate with food or drugs or alcohol or sex or, you know, talking, incessant talking and pontificating about different various topics and political stances, and then feel as if you participated and you did something that was, you know, catalyzing change or evolving. It's it takes diligence to commit to spiritual practice, meditation observation within yourself, self-inquiry, refining your diet, um, using uh, movement of the body f to actually understand that this is a body temple. It takes diligence. And, you know, I was talking to a friend today who was talking to me about how he, he hasn't had as much evolution as that he, he wanted. And it's like, I had to point out to him that he's kind of been on the sidelines. He's not really in the commitment of saying to the universe, I am here, I am showing up for this. And it's a practice and it's it's really a thing because these moments are very, very precious. And so what if it did matter every single thing you did every day? What if there was no like downtime where I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna eat this lollipop or I'm just gonna watch this crime show cause I like it, that's what I like, I like crime show. Like what if, Every you're making, you're single fun of me. No, but I'm <laughs> I'm I am and I'm not. I mean yeah. the thing, you know, myself, you know, like I, I'll have this feeling like, oh, I had this big expansion, you know, now, you know, I'm gonna check out for a while. Like, how is it that we're checking out? And what if we understood how precious every moment of this life was? And what, you know, everybody has the same 24 hours in the day, at least in this realm. So um, <laughs> you know, time is a funny thing. Uh but you know, that's something that I've been I've been really pondering, and I guess it's come to my awareness with my connection with Dom and her spiritual community in, in Italy near Torino, and Falco, the founder, you know, they were um, 
they were doing some experiments in time travel and they would move simply a stone from one position to the other position and that would change a trajectory of history. And so that brought into my awareness just how important everything we do, the way we do things, our intention when we do things, how are we spending that downtime? And really how important is that crime show? Like, is it, what are we doing with our attention if we are powerful creators, which we are? So we live in a quantum world and we're choosing to place our intention on a scenario that is not expansive for humanity. And we're, sometimes that can be for an exploration to learn about something that's in, out of balance so that we can formulate a solution. And so it's not having blinders on and not knowing what's going on, but this brings me to a tendency in the culture is to call out all the problems that are going on, which makes the ego feel really justified because the ego's taken a stance. But if we are in fact quantum be beings, and we're only calling out the problems and looking for everything that is lacking, then how are we participating in the upliftment of our world? And what if, I've talked about this before, so we are all Christic beings, or we are, we are Christ beings, and not in a religious sense, in a spiritual sense. And so the real meaning of, of being a Christ is holding something in a higher vision despite appearances to the contrary. So I've done that with, through our life with the transition and the, um, the evolution of our house and going through financial collapse and me holding this vision and serving that with ceremony and commitment, coming back and back to it again and again and again, no matter how many lawyers and how many business people told me I was crazy, I still held it. It was like six years or five years that I did that, the crazy person in the room, and then that reality came to fruition and we're here now. Same thing, Mr. Wash, um, who was one of the speakers at Original Thinkers, um, held this vision that he would be released from a life sentence in prison, painted it into a painting. I, I may have talked about this before, but just to understand that he was quantumly participating in creating the world he wanted to create. So I ran into David Holbrook, who's the founder of Original Thinkers at Mercado Sagrado. Original Thinkers is is an ideas festival, kind of like Aspen Ideas Festival or TED, <clears throat> that takes place in Telluride that we uh, we attended this yeah, year. Yeah, and an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, festival. And so many uh, good, creative, beautiful human beings doing amazing things on planet Earth. And um, and I was speaking to him, and he was asking me, you know, what do you think about next year? And so we're going to have a meeting in December. But I told him, you know, where is the vision? Where, what are what have what are we creating? And not that I want to make a grand consensus because that will be very multi layered because we're all different life forms. But what are we committing to as feeling beings that want? a different reality on earth. We want our waters clean. We want our animals cared for. We want ourselves healthy. We want our starving children fed. We want the pedophilia to be gone from this planet. What are we doing to hold the higher vision? This is the moment. We have all the energy here to support us. And I see so many people just talking about the problems, the problems, the problems, the problems, and then going away. And where is the beauty? So I think this is the mission. This is the task or the opportunity that we have right now. And to spend times as we've shared about our experience, how do you create a beautiful experience in your life? You spend time doing the things that you love because that creates a loving field and that becomes magnetic. So how can we take that feeling and then roll it out to all of our individual mission. Shrimu's a part of my mission, your podcast and your, you know, your books and your writings, that's a part of your vision. And all of us have a piece. All of us have something to share. But can we understand that we are quantum beings and that we are creating this? And I don't mean put your head in the sand and say it's all unicorns and rainbows and we're going to skip away together. I'm not talking about that. We know we're in a planetary realm that has tremendous levels of of you know miasm and dark uh, happenings that are happening in this realm. Um, so I'm not an illusion, but I'm saying we are the quantum healers. We are the quantum masters. 
let's step into that and let's let's make an experiment and let's see what we can do. And if we don't succeed, well, at least we tried. At least we mm. at least we got together and said, hey, let's do that, or let's let's make an agreement that we're going to tweet or post um, you know, 98% positive information and not send any of the negative. You know, I don't know. I, that's, you know, social media is not the answer, but it's no, just I mean, like an idea. Yeah, it's not. I mean, I think there's a, Obama talked about this in that clip that I shared, and I think you retweeted as well, this idea, this illusion that if you're attacking people on social media or, you know, standing in judgment of others, that you're, you're really only serving your own ego, you know, and, and you're, you're, um, you're creating this illusion that you've actually done something when you actually haven't done anything. So tweeting positive things is great, but what are you actually doing in your life, right? Let's transcend the digital space to actually be functional in the solution of the things that, you know, ail us culturally right now. Um, we need more of that. And I think that you're, you know, spot on in those other observations. Um, we're on the precipice now. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing uh, the podcast that I did with John and Molly Chester of Apricot Lane Farms. They are the people behind the documentary, The Biggest Little Farm. So if you're listening to this, that show has already gone up and you're aware that I've posted that. And this has been a, a tricky, you know, it's on the subject of, of other people's judgment and, 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 you know, negative, you know, perspectives on things um, because there was a certain contingent of the vegan community that was very unhappy that I visited this farm and chose to engage these people in a conversation around climate change and, and regenerative farming practices and, um, carbon sequestration and soil health and all of these things. And it was disheartening. Like, I understand, like, look, I'm vegan. I've been vegan for 12 years. I chose not to participate in this um, cycle of animal harm a long time ago. But I'm also very conscious that these issues are not binary. They're more complicated than that. And, you know, this is a, a couple who left their urban existence in Santa Monica to try to do something. They weren't going to tweet how the soil is being depleted. They actually went and bought a farm and tried to repair the soil. Imagine that. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, along the way, they made a choice that that I would like to believe I wouldn't make, which is to sell a few of their animals for food from time to time. Um, and because of that, there's a, a section of the vegan community that was very unhappy with me um, and my choice to have a conversation with these people. And, and that's disheartening to me because these are people who have a lot of experience in what it's re what's actually required when you put your hands in the dirt to sequester that carbon and be in the solution of climate change. And I have a lot of respect for that and I have empathy for that. So back to Uncle Jerry sitting across from the table, I am not sitting in judgment of these people. In fact, I'm expressing empathy for them. And that empathy doesn't necessarily have to be tied to an endorsement of every single belief and behavior that they engage in, but I can celebrate some things that they're doing that I think are worthy of notice and worthy of being celebrated. Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, is that these individuals, and it was from the love of their dog, actually. They had a dog that, would, that wouldn't stop barking. And isn't this, isn't Yeah, so they, right? they ended up, yeah, like the, they got evicted from their apartment in Santa Monica. And they were like, we need to find a place for our dog. And the dog had like a name like Tony, like a very I, human like, dog I or something. The name, yeah. So yeah, so they created this farm really for this dog. And it's turned into this 10-year, you know, expression. And you know, uh, myself, I, you know, I have no experience growing food. I have no experience with soil. You know, we have three acres here that it's our dream to develop it to, you know, we've left it wild. So we use hardly any water, but. But we're to, not, we're, we're not, not we're, farmers. We're not in the process of, 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 uh, you know, replenishing the soil. No. We're podcasting and making <laughs> vegan cheese. So I'll go on Twitter and talk about soil regeneration and climate change. And I can have conversations with amazing people that help spread that message, but my hands are not in the dirt. 
Right. And so the thing is, is that's your, that's your skill, right? That's your divine design. And their divine design is that they created this whole ecosystem. I mean, I saw, I didn't see the whole movie, but I saw some of the footage and it's like, they have like whole, like, you know, flocks of birds returning. I mean, the thing is just thriving. It's crazy what they've created. Now I'm not, I wouldn't make the choice to slaughter the animal. It's not, it's not what I'm doing. Um, but I'm looking at everything that they're doing right. They they have so I have so much to learn from them. So much to learn from them. How would I how would I ever judge them? How would I ever be in judgment of them? I just I couldn't be. So everyone has to understand that when we wake up we're causing harm. I had this question come up in my um community call just a couple of days ago and it was about this question of veganism and you know what's right and what's wrong and i would bring it back to yourself and say that every single act that you participate in in any lifetime in any realm you will have to reconcile that act and so it's really about you and you how are you know is that an alignment for you and this is one of the reasons maybe that i haven't been embraced by the vegan community is because i was raised in Alaska, my dad was a hunter. And even though I was a child and I was raised, you know, with meat and then later when I discovered yoga, I stopped eating meat just naturally. I still never really made uh, a statement or a declaration. Like I don't really consider myself vegan. I am a feeling connected being who spontaneously makes decisions in the moment, and I've always said that if my body told me that it needed meat as medicine, I would find the cleanest meat, I would do a prayer over it, eat it in reverence until I didn't need it anymore. Now that's never happened and I don't foresee it happening, but I don't like, um, I think when we bring violence into our choices and we're using them to separate ourselves from people, um, we really miss. And for you to be attacked because you showed the sustainable practices of this farm is just very short-sighted. And, and that's, you know, I've said this before, like if we bring violence into the kitchen over our food choices, we've missed the entire point. So again, it's not my choice. Um, I love plant-based um, lifestyle and that's why I created Shrimu. Obviously I'm very focused for the planet, but each individual has to make those decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to gauge the reaction of of this podcast. I mean, the truth is, the overwhelming you know response when I posted on Instagram was was positive. And these themes, these subjects, regenerative farming, um, sustainable agriculture. This is this is a theme that is recurring all the time on the show and echoed by a lot of my guests, including Zach Bush, who's a huge favorite on the show. Um, Rylan Englehart behind Cafe Gratitude. I'm putting up that episode soon. David Bronner, uh, all kinds of people that that the audience embraces are basically saying the same thing, which is the solution that we seek is underneath our feet, and there is a process, there is a way to live in that solution. And these are people that are doing it, and I wanted to understand that better and 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 celebrate that aspect of what it is that they do. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing that isn't being um, really recognized is the fact that the interaction is two-way. So you go into the farm, and they interact with you, and you interact with them. Who knows? Maybe in six months, they make an adjustment that means that they, you know, harvest less animals than they were, or maybe it affects them deeply, just your presence, simply the fact that you went there. Maybe there's another solution. I don't know. Well, I think overall, it's about broadening our aperture and understanding that nothing is binary. We have this tendency to believe there's a right and there's a wrong and there's a black and there's a white. And you said it earlier, like none of us is immune from doing harm. Like we're all perpetrating harm. There are all negative consequences to the fact that we're living beings on planet earth. And there's a, there's a tendency among certain people to develop an ego attachment to a particular type of lifestyle. And with that becomes a hardening and a judgment of other people. Um, and I think that that is unhealthy. And I think that the more that we can 
um, understand that we're all human beings having a spiritual experience and we're having our journeys and, and, and the more empathy that we can have for other people and the, the more humility that we can engender when we go into social interactions from a place of, uh, you know, coming from the heart and, and an openness, like a, a, a growth mindset to mm -hmm. like learn from another human being, then mm -hmm. I think that that is the solution, you know, to a lot of what ails us and what we see being played out in social media. Like we all know <clears throat> that our information diet is really important and it's gonna dictate, you know, a lot of our opinions and worldviews. So if you're, you know, politically right, your Twitter feed is gonna look a certain way. If you're a progressive liberal, you're gonna have a completely different news feed that is, that is gonna, you know, basically channel you everything that affirms your worldview. Well, it's no different in health and nutrition. Mm -hmm. If you're a keto person or a low carb person or a carnivore person, your feed is gonna basically be a constant stream of people that see the world the way that you do and practice what you practice. If you're a vegan, that feed is gonna be very differently. And these camps are becoming further and further separated and entrenched in their views because there's no cross-pollination. And so my effort and my interest in going to people like John and Molly Chester is to participate in that cross-pollinization, to have the humility to understand like, these people know a lot about a certain thing that I talk about all the time on the podcast. And I wanna learn more about that, not from the perspective of a doctor or a politician or an academic, but from people who are actually practitioners who are doing this day in and day out. Yeah, that was the spirit in which I, I you know, went into that experience and I'm glad that I did and I would do it again. Mm -hmm. And so it's disheartening to be attacked for that. And I get it, the vegans are a passionate community of people. Nobody wants to see animals harmed, but to say that I'm endorsing the slaughter of animals because I wanted to, because I was curious and I followed that curiosity to learn something and then share it is a disheartening perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, so um, I don't want to end it here. We got to no. end this here. But like, <laughs> let's 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 like take well, people out with a but little. But I mean, that's the thing is, <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, you and I, uh, from the very beginning, when we entered into this experiment and this expression, we've only shared our only our own experience. We're not here to tell anybody yeah, what to do I or how to say, live. And we say always that. say that. Yeah. And also this lifestyle is aspirational and it's a moving, changing, evolving, living form. So we're gonna learn new things, find new ways. Um, it's not a stasis or a state of achievement that then you hold on to, you know, with a hardness and a closed mindedness. It's it's an open, moving, breathing experience of life. And we all have things to learn from each other. Yes, we all need to eat more plants. Yes, we need to stop this brutal suffering of animals in industrial um, agriculture. You know, yes, we need to save our oceans. And But we've always had an open door. And so all of our cookbooks have been open to any kind of eater. It's never been an ism for you and for me. And Shrimu is what I call universal. It's vegan, paleo, dairy-free, gluten-free, kosher for all purposes. I'm sure it's keto too, because there's no carbs yeah. in it. So it's kind of everything. It's just for everyone. And if we can eat more plants, and you know, as Paul Hawkins said, you know, face plant-rich lifestyle, um, you know, it's going to be doing good. And everybody has to account and answer to their own actions. So nobody gets out of anything. It will all be accounted for. So we can relax and you know do the best that we can do to serve our own individual awareness. But again, we need this interaction and this brotherhood and sisterhood. We need to not be separated. I was at an event yesterday and the girl next to me speaking has a bone broth company. And I was sitting very close to her and all I was emanating for her was just love and listening to her and she has her own experience. Every 
woman is right from her own point of view. How Every dare you? man How dare is you? right for his own point of view. I can't believe you. Yeah. So, and the thing is, actually, it's funny because some of those people actually even came on my feed trying to get me to have you answer. Like, this means Rich endorses animal brutality. Oh, you t- I was oh like, really? really? Yeah. I was like, really? Is that what it means? So now you're a proxy. <laughs> exactly. Like, even if At, it's for, like, I talked to a guy yesterday who talked to another guy who talked to another guy who knows a guy that Mm. works at, uh, you know, a a chicken factory. So Mm. I'm endorsing. It's like, it's insane. It's insane. But the thing is this is, and we have to remember this also as individual creators and those of us who came here to, you know, be the sacred makers in our own fields and, and put things out in the world. We need to not be, um, affected by that judgment and by those swords that are th- that are thrown. Um, we really need to understand that when you act in alignment, so you just said a minute ago, you said, I would, I stand by what I do. I would make the same decision again. That's your answer. So you didn't do something that was out of alignment with who you are and your intentions were in high alignment with your mission of creating a higher way of living on planet Earth. There's no question about that. You weren't uh, compromised. You didn't receive money. You didn't, like there was no compromise. There was no compromise in your integrity. You did what is in alignment with you and you would do it again. And that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, I followed. It doesn't matter. I did did what I've done from day one, which is follow my curiosity. That's it. I'm not here to serve the best interests of a dogma. You know, like I'm not, you know, some, I'll get criticism saying like, I can't believe you have non-vegans on your podcast. It's like, I choose to eat plants. It's a lifestyle that I've adopted that serves me well. I think there's tremendous benefits in this for personal health, for environmental health, for, for animal welfare and the like. And I'm happy to talk about it. And I talk about it all the time, but I don't define myself by that alone, aren't we all more expansive beings? I'm here to learn about all different kinds of things. I wanna be exposed to new ideas across the board. I'm not here to just focus on this one issue. I'm not a single issue voter or a single issue focused individual. And I think we all need to kind of um, understand that that, um, it's important to realize that we're bigger than these labels that we attach to ourselves that make us feel like we belong because there's an identification there to a certain group that makes us feel um, like we're part of something. And I understand that, like I get all that, but there's more going on. But again, if if we really care about the planet and we care about our life and we want to lift this experience higher, it's about the interaction with many diverse life forms. So I think in soil regeneration, diversity is a key underlying founda- foundational power which creates a healthy environment. We have to bring that awareness of diversity into our own life forms. Yeah, that's They're, a great point. Right? I mean, it's all about diversity. The the In the narrative of the movie, it's like none of this works until you get to this tipping point in biodiversity. And then it becomes like this thriving thing that becomes self-perpetuating. To get it to that point was very difficult, but fundamentally that's what, what it's all about. And I think there's a teacher in that. And the teacher is that, that diversity is necessary to the holistic well-being of of the larger ecosystem, right? And the more that we can practice that and participate in that emotionally, um, that is also the path towards the greater um, well-being of the ecosystem of the population. Well, and what if we took the, all that focus or that energy that is in fighting for this thing, this flag that you're flying or this truth or this ism or this dogma or whatever you think this intellectual stasis point is. What if we took that energy and instead you gave it to yourself and you went and loved yourself and you inquired within yourself and you found out what you loved to do when you were a child and you made a commitment to yourself, I'm going to be here for you and I'm going to guide you and and help you and protect you to express everything that you want to. And you are loved, you're valued. What if we took that and brought it in instead of all that focus of protecting something that's not even a thing, it's just an illusion, it's a made up 
It's a made-up construct. And, you know, if you're fighting for peace, you're still fighting. I think Gandhi said that. I'm thinking. I'm not sure. Somebody said it. But if you're fighting for anything, you're still fighting. So what if we stop fighting and just realize there is no consensus? There are billions of life forms that are interacting here. And so how can we come to each other when we're not the same? And instead of be in judgment and analysis and separation, what if we just said, please show me more of who you are? Show me. I'm so interested. I'm so curious. Tell me who you are. Why is it that you feel that way? How is it that you feel when you experience and express your own divinity or whatever your life mission is? We need to soften these edges and understand that we all share this planet. We're all riding on this planet together. And the controller forces that want us to, uh, to you know, fight and, and not rise up, they are putting these diverse um, uh, energies into the population. They want us fighting. They want us focused on fighting. Did you ever remember there was like a fairy tale book that I had? And I think the one was called the stubborn sillies or something. And it was a man and a wife who got in a fight and they were both had their arms crossed and they were not looking at each other. And while they were doing that, a thief came in and stole everything that they had. And so in a way we're fighting and then these thieves are stealing our life from us. They're stealing our livelihood. So um, it's really within our power to imagine vision and then get into action, creating the world that we want to experience here together. This is a magnificent planet, and human beings are feeling creative, connected, empathic, loving, amazing individuals. And when we have knowledge, we have a power that can never be taken from us. When we remember who we are, that we are divine, and when you enter into that awareness, um, you have so much power and so much creativity and so much energy with which to create. And so this is really the time and we are the ones we've been waiting for. You are the one you've been waiting for. It's not someone else coming. Powerful Srimati, closing it down <laughs> with the truth and the wisdom. So I want everybody to remember that when you're sitting across your Thanksgiving or holiday table from your version of Uncle Jerry. Root yourself in your experience. Have patience. Practice empathy and compassion. Um, and uh, hopefully you can have a different and joyous experience. What do you think? I think so. I can see it. I'm going to hold that vision for you. Let's hold that vision. Let's not hope. Let's there. hold that vision. Cool. Well, always a pleasure. Thank you, my dear. I thank said you, it again. Rich Roll. Babe. No, you said darling. Oh, and now darling. It's dear. dear. All right. Thank uh -huh. you, my darling. Um, good talk. How do you feel? I feel good. Do you good. think it was good? No, it's good. Okay, good. Um, if you want to learn more about Julie Pyatt, aka Srimati, she is at Srimati on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to learn more about the cheese, Srimu.com is the place to go for that. Uh, and that's it. Have a happy holiday, everybody. I'm taking off. I'll catch you on the flip side. Shows will go up as they always do on schedule. Um, but, uh, I'm going to be taking care of myself. And I'll see you in the secret place. <laughs> you will. You will. All After right, I time. ship all my orders. <laughs> all right. Peace. Okay. Namaste. Plants. Plants.